Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 2.6, I guess the last module for this week. Now, just to remind you what we did, it's like what you're interested in is describing current flow through small devices, this atomistic models for current flow. And the first step is, of course, writing down this H matrix, the Hamiltonian matrix, which describes the channel. That's what was week one. And then week two, that is this week, was about obtaining this set of equations called the NEGF equations, which actually allow you to calculate current, density of states, electron density, all kinds of observable quantities of interest that you can compare with experiment. And here the two basic inputs are H from last week, and then you need these sigmas, the sigma 1 and sigma 2, which tell you the connection to the contact. And as we work out different problems, today we'll be doing a simple problem, and next week we'll be doing, and the following week we'll be doing more, looking at more and more problems, and then it should give you a feeling for how these sigmas are written down. And the basic equations then, as I said, these two are the basic NEGF equations, one and two. Gn, that's like electron density. A is like density of states, that's number three. I guess, except for this factor of two pi that I've mentioned. And then if you want current, you have this equation. And the sigmas, there is a component from contact one and a component from contact two. Okay. Now, as I explained at the end of the last I guess in the last module, then, is that when you have two terminal devices, simple two terminal devices, and we are not including any non-coherent effects, things that we haven't talked about here so far, that current equation can be modified to look like this, where this quantity is what's called the transmission, and it's like the conductance function that we used in part one, which is discussed in lecture three of the notes. Okay, that's now, and that quantity then we now have a quantum expression for this from this quantum model, which is trace of gamma 1 g gamma 2 g a. And this is the quantity that we'll be calculating for a simple one dimensional conductor. So you have a one dimensional conductor, and we are using the simplest Hamiltonian from week one that we talked about, where basically the diagonal elements are epsilon, and the connection to the nearest neighbors is this T. So if I were to write down H, it would look something like, uh, let's write it here. If I were to write H, it would be epsilons down the diagonal, and T's on the upper diagonal, and T's on the lower diagonal. That's the H that we need to describe this Hamiltonian. Now, in order to proceed further, what I need to tell you is how to write this sigma 1 and the sigma 2. These two things that tell you the connection to the contacts. Because once we have that, after that, mathematically, it's straightforward. In other words, we have the same, we have these equations. You can ask a computer to basically solve these for you. But as I've mentioned before, here there's kind of two aspects to it. One is knowing how to calculate it, and the other part is understanding what you are calculating. And one needs to do both of those things to get a real feeling for how this works. So what we'll be doing starting today, this module and the coming modules is looking at different examples. I'll be telling you exactly how you calculate certain things, and then we'll try to understand what we have calculated. Okay. Now, first then, in order to proceed with the calculation, I need the sigma 1 and sigma 2. So how do we do that? Well, the argument goes something like this. Supposing the wire ends here, let's say. So this is the point N. And the point N plus 1 is inside the contact. We don't want to include it. So up to here is described by H. 
that then is part of sigma. And so this is n, this is n minus 1. So if I were to write down the basic equation at that point, then as you, if you, as you may recall from week 1, it would look something like E psi n is equal to, you see E psi equals H psi and we are trying to write the nth element of that. So it's like E psi n and since epsilon is the n n element and this is the n minus 1 n and that's the, I, I'm sorry, this is the n n minus 1 and that's the n n plus 1. So you could write it as T psi n minus 1 plus epsilon psi n plus T psi n plus 1. So this is the basic equations that you would have if you just consider this wire and write down the equations right around there. Epsilon on the diagonal, T connecting it to the nearest neighbors. Now the thing is, what we are trying to do is get rid of this one because n plus 1 is a something inside the contact. And the way we get rid of it here is by using what's called the open boundary condition, which means we say that, well, if they have an electron incident here, it just goes straight into the contact and doesn't come back. So when I look here, all I have is a outgoing wave. See? And an outgoing wave is represented by something like e to the power i k z plus i k z. That's an outgoing wave. And that is based on the idea that, you see, what we had discussed in uh, back in week one was that the dispersion relation corresponding to this would look like, take this off for the moment. So if I had to draw the dispersion relation, E versus K, as you remember, it is like E is equal to epsilon plus 2T cosine Ka. And T is usually negative, which gives it a shape looking something like this. Right? And we are usually interested in this lowest part of this thing around here. Now, for there's any energy, there's a plus k and then there's a minus k. And the plus k states for which you can write the wave function as e to the power i k z. And for these, you would be like negative k's. Now, these are the ones that have, that are carrying power, carrying current in the positive z direction because they have a velocity which is positive because velocity is given by dE dk. So this is something we'll be using more of. So let me write that. One thing you may recall from again part one is that e that velocity is dE dp dp and now that we are using k is like momentum is equal to h bar k so you could write here, instead of momentum, we could write k, but then there will be a 1 over h bar, which I could put here. Okay. So the point is, around here, e k, d e d k is positive. So these are the ones for which the velocity is in the positive z direction. And for those, we'll, that's what we have here. So we are assuming that things are, that the electron is going out into the contacts and nothing is coming back. Now, so if you assume that the wave function looks like this, then you see you could write psi n as e to the power i k n a because at the point n, z is equal to n a, whereas psi n plus 1 is equal to e to the power i k n plus 1 times a which makes it e to the power i k a times psi n. So in other words, if you assume that out here all you have is an outgoing wave, 
then wave function at n plus 1 is just this phase factor times the wave function at n. And that allows us then to replace this with e to the power i k a psi n. That's it. So once you do that, you have got rid of this n plus 1 and this extra term is like what we have actually would call the self-energy finally. So it is sort of, I could bring that in and couple, connect it to this and write it as, so this stays as is, but now you have this epsilon plus t e to the power i k a times psi n. So this is this extra term that is like your self energy or that is the sigma 1. Remember what we were trying to do was write these quantities, these sigma 1s and sigma 2 and inside we have a Hamiltonian H and then this sigma 1 and sigma 2 sort of add to it, right? So these additive terms, this additive term that came from the boundary condition is like part of the sigma 1 and sigma 2. So what would happen then is, when we write sigma 1 or sigma 2, it would look something like this. So if you're writing sigma 1, that means something on this side, right around the first point, then the correction would be to the first point. Whereas when you're writing sigma 2, that's on this side, then the correction is to the last point. So if you're writing sigma 2, it would be like there would be a t e to the power i k a around at the last point, which denotes the fact that you're adding it to the diagonal element there, and everything else is zero. So that's sigma 2. And if you're writing sigma 1, then this additional term is at the left end, at 1, 1 point. Everything else is zero. So that's it, really, you see? We have the H from week one, and the sigma one is all zeros except for this T to the power i k a, and the sigma two is again all zeros except for the T e to the power i k a. And once you have this H sigma one and sigma two, as I said, numerically it is straightforward now. You could go to the computer, ask it to calculate G R, it will involve matrix inverses, Size of the matrix depends on the number of points along your wire. So let's say 100 points. That's a 100 by 100 matrix, easily inverted. You'll have GR. And once you have GR, I mean, you could go ahead, calculate currents. Or for our purpose, what we might do here is calculate this quantity, this trace of gamma 1 G, gamma 2 G A. And if you calculate this and plot it, it would look something like this. Let me yeah, draw it here. So if I take this quantity and plot it as a function of energy, what you'll find is that if, let's say, the E versus K relation looks something like this. You know, the, that's the one I had drawn there. Then you'll find that the transmission will be one within this band, within this region, it will be one. And it will be zero elsewhere. In other words, if an electron came in from the contact, with an energy anywhere within this e band of energies around here, it would go, the transmission would be 1, and what that means is the conductance would be Q squared over H. On the other hand, if it was outside where there was no energies, and no le energy levels inside the channel, there would be no current, and you'd get something like this. On the other hand, if we want to include a say uh, some kind of scatterer so that it's not a ballistic conductor. You see what I just talked about is a ballistic conductor completely. So this is a uniform conductor, electrons go straight through. 
Now, what if there was a impurity inside? So, if there's an impurity at that point, for example, what would happen is it would give rise to some additional potential right there. So, instead of having, so in general, the diagonal element is epsilon, but right at that point, it would be epsilon plus something, some u. Just at that one point. Elsewhere, it's the same. Exactly. And so, what would happen? How would we include that? Well, nothing changes as far as sigma 1 goes. Nothing changes as far as sigma 2 goes. The only change is when you write h. That is, you see, usually the way we write h is we write epsilons down the diagonal and t's on the upper and lower diagonal, as we have discussed. And now all we have to do is go to that particular point and add u. That's it. So otherwise it's the same matrix. You just add the u at that point. If you happen to have multiple impurities, well, you add appropriate u's at the right place. So numerically it's perfectly straightforward. You just set up that matrix, add that u, and then what you'd find is, if you actually calculate this transmission, you'll find it's no longer one because of the u. It'll, it's probably doing something like this. Like I had indicated in the, at the end of the last module. See? There will be transmission less than one. What that means is the conductance wouldn't be q squared over h anymore, the ballistic conductance. It would be something less. And this will then just come automatically out of the numerical model, if you have set it right. And when you're getting started with this method, I always say that this is a very good problem to start with, to make sure you know how to do this, is use that h, use these sigmas, and see if you can get these plots. See, firstly, the plot where it's exactly one in the band and zeros elsewhere, and then put in a scatterer and see if you get this. Actually, there's, this is a problem that could also be done analytically, almost, you see? And so let me just indicate how you could actually get an expression for that curve analytically. Okay. So the way it would work is something like this. See, usually the reason you need a computer is that I've got a matrix which I have to invert, okay? Now, if it was a one by one matrix, that's like a number. Inverting is no problem. Two by two matrices you could do by hand. Anything more than that gradually gets uncomfortable. But of course, for a computer, 100 by 100 is no big deal. That's just, that's easy, you see? So the reason you need a computer is because you have the big, you have these big matrices. The thing is in a problem like this, this is a uniform wire, you could take your device as just one point. You see, because these are uniform wires where anything that goes away doesn't come back, you could do this calculation with 100 points, but if you have done it right, you could just as well do it with 10 points, you'd get the same answer, and you could just as well do it with one point, you know, the, just the point with the impurity in it, that's it, and you'd get exactly the same answer. Okay. And that one, of course, I can do on the blackboard right now, you see, and it will give you exactly the same answer that you would get by taking, you know, 100 points, 10 points, whatever you like, and they should all match. So this is a very good test case to work out in the beginning to make sure you, are, you have got it and you know how to implement these things. Okay. So let me show you what you expect then when you do this with just one point. Well, if it's one point, then you see your H matrix, it's not a matrix, it's just a number. You see the H, so it's just epsilon plus U. That's it. One number. If you want sigma 1, that's just T to the power I K A. One number. If you want sigma 2, that's also the same, t to the power i k a. That's it, okay? So now if you want the Green's function, that's this retarded Green's function g r, that's e minus h minus sigma inverse, okay? 
So I can write gr right here and it's equal to e minus h which is epsilon minus u and minus sigma and sigma has these two parts sigma 1 and sigma 2 and they are both equal so I'll have minus 2t e to the power i k a inverse. Now you'll notice this thing has a real part and an imaginary part. This exponential you could write as cosine plus i sine. So you could write this as e minus epsilon minus 2t cosine k a minus u. So what I've done is e epsilon u and then the real part I've taken together. And then there's the imaginary part. And this is the whole thing that has to be inverted. And this is where, you see, I can make use of this rule, this E equals epsilon plus 2T cosine Ka, because this applies to the uniform wires at the ends. It does not apply inside where there could be a potential that's varying, in which case a dispersion relation doesn't apply to what's inside. But we are really talking about the wave out here in the leads where it's all uniform. And so E for any energy, the K is correspondingly related by this relation. So what that means is this is all zero. This is out. You see? So you have now an expression for GR which basically looks like one, I mean inverse, and since this is just a number, I could write it as one minus u minus 2t sine ka. That's it. Sure. Now, this second thing that appears here could be written in a slightly different way. And that's useful, and that's the following. You see, we said that this is the dispersion relation, and velocity is dE dk. Now, if you actually take the derivative of this, you'll notice what you get is minus 2at sine ka. Right? When I take the derivative of the cosine, I get the sine with a negative sign, and then there's the a. So you see there's this 2t sine ka and then a a. So that quantity here, you see, is like h bar v divided by a. So that's gr. Okay. So I'll write that here. Good. And now we are done, almost. You see, we need to find this quantity, this trace. That's what's transmission. Q squared over H times this quantity gives you the conductance. That's what you're trying to find. Each one is a number, so I really don't need to take off trace of anything. Just multiply three things, there are four things. So gamma one, what you can show is gamma one is like again twice the imaginary from here, you'd get it as the twice the imaginary part of that. So you'd get this H bar V over A, you can show. This will be another H bar V over A. So the point is you'll get something like this. So what you can show is gamma 1, that's like this uh, i times sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dagger. And sigma 1 is t e to the power i k a. So after you do all that, you'll get this minus 2 t sine k a. Okay. And that, as we just discussed, is like h bar v over a. So the point is, this is h bar v over a. That's also h bar v over a. So together, they give me a h bar v over a squared. And then you divide it by, this multiplied by, this Green's function. And this is its con conjugate transpose. Since we are talking of just a number, what it means is conjugate. So you multiply this by its complex conjugate. What, what you get then is u squared plus h bar v over a square. 
that's it. So this is the basic answer that we are trying to get. This is the result that the transmission is given by h bar v over a u square plus h bar v over a square. And if there was no potential, if u were zero, then you can see the transmission would have been one. And as you increase u, the transmission goes down. So that's basically this curve here. So this is the curve that you can, that we just obtained a, I guess, analytical expression for this. That's it. Now one thing you'll notice if you look back at what we did was that in order to get this result that without any potential it is exactly one, it was rather important to use this complex sigmas, you know, with a t e to the power i k a, which has a real part which is 2t cosine k a and an imaginary part. If you had not in, had the real part in there, then it wouldn't have, you wouldn't have got such a nice clean thing which was one in the middle and, z, and zero elsewhere. It, it, instead of this, it would be something that was varying much overall energy. You wouldn't quite have this clean thing. So this particular self energy, this sigma one, sigma two, that's what it's called, it actually gives you this very clean, sometimes people use the word matching, matching to the contacts, so that when an electron comes in, it just goes straight out. So if instead of this, you had used something a little different, like you left the real part out, kept only the imaginary part, then what would happen is, effectively, when an electron is trying to get out, there would be some reflections. It wouldn't go cleanly out. That's what engineers often call a matched contact, meaning anything that goes out, you know, just goes out cleanly, nothing comes back. And so, this is always a very good example to go through, because, as I said, if you have any mistakes, you would never get this nice rectangular thing. That doesn't happen by accident. You'd have to get all the phases and calculations correct to get that. So that kind of give, is a very good first example to get a feeling for how these things work. And if you go through these homework problems, which I'll be going over in the tutorial lectures, I think you should get a good head start on this whole NEGF way of doing things. And in the coming weeks, I guess we'll look at increasingly more complicated examples.